So I'll conclude this uh, discussion on model specification issues with the uh, with the discussion of the so-called pretest bias that uh, that you really should be aware of in the empirical modeling. So let's come back to this um, discussion of empirical modeling strategies. So like I mentioned that uh, that uh, typically there are some core variables that uh, that we necessarily uh, or, or self-evidently want to want to uh, include in the model, but then there can be uh, some uh, secondary variables that we are not entirely sure of, uh, or there can be can be such kind of uh, approaches to model non-linearities, uh, a functional form, uh, perhaps uh, intercept or slope dummies. Uh, so uh, already by now our toolbox is quite full of many different approaches that could be potentially used and we are not necessarily entirely sure of what kind of uh, what kind of uh, model specification would be the most suitable for the for the application at hand and i i repeat that of course uh, one one important uh, point of all of this is is to actually learn from the data that what kind of um, model specification uh, is useful but uh, but I already warned that uh, that uh, there is uh, potential potential caveats in, for example, regarding the omitted variable bias. So another caveat is is uh, so-called pretest bias, and um, I have noticed that uh, that uh, uh, some students, for example, doing the master's thesis, uh, are, are utilizing uh, this kind of automated stepwise regression which is uh, available in many statistical packages so uh, the stepwise regression is searching for the for the model specification and uh, automatically and then then finds the the regressors that uh, that uh, turn out to be statistically significant so um, this might be a very very tempting approach but uh, i always advise against uh, using it uh, the main main reason is uh, is perhaps the omitted variable bias, but also there is the so-called uh, uh, pretest bias. And uh, in my view, it's it's somewhat uh, somewhat um, uh, unfortunate that uh, that uh, many statistical packages do offer this kind of kind of tools. So uh, so I don't really see much uh, much uh, uh, use for this kind of kind of uh, stepwise uh, regression tools. Because it's very well known that uh, that uh, so-called pretest estimators are, are known to be biased, uh, and if the standard errors overlook the, the the additional bias in the sort of search for the model specification, then then this can lead to to very wrong results. So let me come back to the to this in more little bit more detail, and uh, I want to include here uh, uh, some some uh, uh, quotation from uh, from article by Danilov and, and Magnus in, in Journal of Econometrics it's already 16 years ago but I believe it's still very much uh, uh, relevant today so uh, this is relatively relatively easy to follow even if you uh, even if it's uh, though it's kind of a, a technical econometrics paper so in this quotation that I have uh, have uh, copied here, they consider linear regression model, and you can think of these x variables as uh, as these variables that we we do want to include in the model for sure. And then there is uh, another set of uh, variables in indicated by z. And uh, as researcher, we are not sure that should should z be not in the model or not. And the authors note that uh, that. Uh, that is very common procedure to to then uh, apply some statistical test uh, to to test that is uh, uh, whether the z variables should be used or not. We could use, for example, the f test or the cho test that we we uh, discussed earlier in this uh, theme. And then after running this test, uh, then uh, it's very common to then report uh, the model specification that was that was chosen. The problem here is that uh, that this uh, testing stage is not taken into account. So so uh, so uh, when you first run this uh, this test, uh, whether to include Z or not, and then then afterwards you pretend as as if it was uh, was clear from the beginning, then uh, the standard errors for those uh, those uh, beta coefficients uh, uh, would be biased. So 
the correct approach would be in some sense to to adjust the, the standard errors of those beta coefficients uh, uh, for this uh, pretest phase. But uh, that's not usually usually done in, in, in most of the econometric works that I'm aware of. So uh, in this, uh, it's taken from the introduction of that article, the authors also conclude that in spite of all this literature, we are still far removed from having a fully integrated procedure of model selection and parameter estimation. So the problem here is that, uh, that this model selection phase is not a taking into account this uh, in these kind of specification tests, uh, particularly if they are done in a stepwise manner with multiple, multiple steps. So if you run t-test or f-tests uh, in the stepwise manner, then we should also adjust this uh, subsequent test for this possibility of pretest bias. Okay, so um, how do we avoid then in practice this kind of pretest bias? Because uh, I already mentioned that, uh, of course, we also want to learn from this uh, this uh, this kind of econometric uh, exercise. So, so I would suggest uh, at least one good practice, uh, uh, for example, in a thesis work, would be that. Uh, that uh, even if you run this kind of specification tests uh, or you, you, you have some t-test and you find that some of the uh, explanatory variables that you included in the model turn out to be uh, insignificant, but um, I would not then advise you to throw away those variables and run the, uh, run the model again without those, uh, because that, uh, that, that kind of like model specification search is certainly subject to the pretest bias. It's perfectly fine to also in, it's per, perfectly fine to report uh, coefficients of insignificant variables because if you thought in the initially that those variables should be in the model, then also your reader might be thinking that okay, why you didn't control for this kind of factor or that kind of factor? So it's perfectly fine to uh, show to the reader that uh, that uh, yes, you have control for them, but uh, they turn out to be insignificant. So. So that's fine. In some sense, if, if, you, if, you're, if you encounter some study that has a large number of explanatory variables and some, somehow all of them turn out to be highly significant, then uh, you might be a little bit suspicious that perhaps there is some kind of uh, um, uh, sort of uh, data mining or pretest bias uh, uh, going on behind the scenes, which is not openly reported. So, um, some authors um, nowadays also also report some alternative uh, model specifications, mainly to to uh, indicate robustness to this kind of specification issues. So you might see four or five different uh, different models, which might include uh, different sets of uh, explanatory variables. And I think this is perfectly fine if the if the results are robust, uh, so so the conclusions don't change dramatically across these model specifications. Then of course, if the if the models are com mod these four five alternative models yield completely different results, then it's kind of um, uh, in some sense irresponsible to leave it just for the reader to draw the conclusions. Okay, now which model the reader should uh, believe in, if you as the as the researcher cannot uh, cannot make your mind which which is the correct model. So. Um, uh, if we go beyond the ordinary least squares and uh, and uh, and um, still um, operate in the linear regression context, though, then uh, very often in machine learning context, this uh, uh, so-called lasso regression is used. So lasso refers to least absolute shrinkage and selection operator, and uh, in that that approach, then this uh, this uh, uh, variable selection and uh, and uh, and estimation is done uh, in a more integrated fashion. It's not stepwise regression anymore, but it's integrated in the in the in this um, estimation procedure. And the the main idea why why lasso works is that uh, there is uh, additional restriction on this on these beta parameters. So we need to have some kind of um, uh, additional parameter t that. And, and uh, the absolute sum of absolute values of this beta coefficient is restricted to be less than or equal to t, where t is this user-specified constant. So this ensures that uh, there is some some uh, uh, finite uh, 
uh, capacity for these beta coefficients that could be included in the model. So this constraint effectively forces that uh, that uh, some of the explanatory variables may get uh, zero values. So this this is potentially useful if there are, there are lots of lots of explanatory variables that you that you that you might want to consider, and and not enough uh, degrees of freedom, not enough observations to to fit all of them. So so with this kind of additional constraint, you can you can then limit the number of uh, variables that uh, that get to the to the estimated model. So there are techniques such as lasso that can be can be used for the for the variable selection, but uh, that falls beyond the scope of the of the present course. So finally, I want to also emphasize that uh, the discussion of the omitted variable bias and redundant variables uh, in in my my lessons here has mainly focused on the situation that we are interested in the estimation of the marginal effect. Okay. So we are mainly interested in the estimating, for example, beta two coefficient. Um, the situation is somewhat different if you, if you want to, if you are mainly interested, for example, predicting the the dependent variable y, and for example, if you also want to want to predict uh, not only in sample but also predict out of sample. So, for example, if you had the time series uh, and we wanted to then predict the future values of the or future development of the dependent variable y. So, whether it's a cross section or, or time series, whatever, then if it, if we talk about um, predictive power of the model, then the common approach is to uh, divide the sample to two subsets, uh, referred to as the training set and the and the validation set. So uh, then the out of sample predictive power, we could of course then then assess. Uh, uh, in, in this way that we first fit in the in the training set our our data and then we see what kind of model is performing best uh, uh, in in the out of sample in terms of the validation set and uh, and there it might be that uh, a simpler model if, even if you have a uh, have um, have some uh, um, or in, in that kind of kind of predictive purposes it might be a good idea to to make a simpler model rather than more complicated model and particularly there it might be might be useful to exclude uh, variables that are are not uh, statistically significant in the training set so i come back to this uh, this uh, econometric forecasting theme uh, in theme number 10 when we when we discuss uh, also time series because very often uh, forecasting refers to time series forecasting Okay, so but of course, out of sample prediction could be also in the cross section. That, for example, if we would use uh, uh, data from uh, from one region to to then try to predict also in in let's say another region, so it could be also also in some some other context. But uh, we will get back to this kind of forecasting theme briefly in theme number ten, and uh, we'll continue the course with the as the next theme. Uh, regarding the endogeneity, so remember that uh, omitted variable bias was uh, was one one uh, special case of the endogeneity. But we will next then address this uh, endogeneity issue more broadly and also get some other examples of endogeneity.